don't have our other presenters back yet, but they will um, they'll come and join us as they finish up uh, with their eating. And I'm sure they'll definitely be back for the strategy sessions. For our afternoon session, we're going to finish up with our last presenter. Uh, we were fortunate enough that Winona LaDuke had sent ahead an assistant to uh, assist her today. But so she's here, and so she's going to be presenting on um, some of the, so the, the Honor the Earth stuff that Winona LaDuke's going to talk about. And we got this whole thing um, that's going to be coming. So I'm going to actually let her introduce herself. Um, she is Jill. I'm going to break this out. What was <laughs> Mardis Minham. I knew I kept saying it in my head over and over. Don't have it in front of me. And she, I'm going to let her introduce herself, and um, we'll just we'll go and then go to question and answer there, and then we'll go into our strategy workshop. So please join me in welcome Jill. Sigourney. Um, my name is uh, Jill Martis Minham. I live in Oneida, Wisconsin, um, and I work with uh, Honor the Earth and Winona LaDuke. Um, and I've been there working for a month, so I ask you to bear with me. And um, I will be delivering a message from Winona. She, she just landed, so she sends her best. and is very disappointed she wasn't able to be here and um, but she was thankful that uh, you would be able to, to at least view the video that we're going to watch and uh, there's some handout materials as well that are in the back um, that are that talk about the work that that we're doing right now um, her presentation is strongly about what's happening uh, with the uh, pipeline proposals in uh, Minnesota and I live in Wisconsin so it's kind of tricky to transition to that and so a lot of the written printed materials will be most helpful specific to that and what I can speak more confidently about is will be a, on a PowerPoint and about some of the um, great things that are going on to look towards and, and about protecting the earth and, and uh, programs and ways to look at it differently than, you know, not just opposing or not just protesting, but being a protector. So we'll watch first the video of the uh, Honor the Earth ride, and then I will talk after that. There's a beauty in the breath of horses. Fall mornings brought a tear in the air and the smell and sound of horses. We rode our horses from the pipelines of the Mississippi and the Gardena on our reservation, along with the coolest ride of a Green Bluff pipeline which we crossed on our reservation. There's a third in a series of rides on pipelines. They're not protesters or protectors. That's who they are. This we call the Triple Crown of Pipeline Rides. Those rides took us on the Alberta Clipper proposed expansion route to the proposed Keystone XL route in the Dakotas, where riders from the White Earth Reservation joined with the Lakota to ride with the Anomali, the Dakini, and the Cheyenne River Reservation. So it was that 15 riders braved some harrowing terrain, a land littered with 100,000 dead cattle, from a freak September blizzard, and rode the proposed Keystone route. And then we came home to our own reservation, where a new pipeline is proposed to cut near our wide, largest wild rice lake. That pipeline will carry fracked oil from the Dakotas. Much of this comes from the homelands of the Arikara, Nandan, and Hidatsa people, also known as the Fort Berthold Reservation, which is under assault by oil companies, and where water and people are challenged not only by a pipeline, but also by a proposed refinery. The other two pipelines carry tar sands oil from the far north in the Athabascan River 
a place that is beautiful and a place that deserves to live and not become a national sacrifice area. Athabasca River Region is a pristine ecosystem. That is until the oil companies come that way. Thus far, 3% of that oil, considered because of its extraction method to be the dirtiest oil in the world, has been ripped from the ground. The boreal forests are being turned into sand dunes. Alberta has become the third largest oil producing state, aka nation in the world. That oil is being extracted without infrastructure to move it. Hence the push for a pipeline, any pipeline. What's at stake is a lot of water and a lot of risk. In Minnesota, it's wild rice, water, and oil. The Enbridge Pipeline is proposing to both expand the present Alberta Clipper, doubling its capacity, and making it the largest tar sands pipeline in the United States. In the Dakotas, it is a land without a single pipeline across it and one large aquifer, the Oglala. The Enbridge Company also wants to construct a 610-mile pipeline from near Tioga, North Dakota, to Superior, Wisconsin. That would carry fracked oil. This is also the same oil as the 800,000 gallons which devastated the Tioga farm in North Dakota early in October. Farmer Stephen Jensen walked into his field and could smell the oil. He had seeped for so long that 800,000 gallons devastated his field. That pipeline was six inches. The proposed sand pipeline is 30. Enbridge's pipelines are largely monitored by the company. Those go through indigenous territories, which are healthy lands, lands that our ancestors wish to protect. We intend to do the same. The single largest pipeline oil spill in US history is a Kalamazoo spill. The fact is that greed makes people act poorly. Rather than investing into efficiency, infrastructure, and renewable or safe energy, the push is to extract as quickly as possible by any means necessary and to move that oil by any means necessary. Right now, most of the oil moving in this country from the Bakken fields moves on railway. That's up to about 380,000 rail cars projected to move this year. This past summer, four square blocks of the town of Lac Megantic, Quebec, blew up as the train's braking systems failed. That train was carrying Bakken oil. Over 40 people were, quote, vaporized in an explosion which baffled Canadian authorities. They had never seen anything like it. That oil, combined with whatever chemicals are in it, is the stuff they want to put into the sand pipeline. The fact is, is that all of these expansions are predicated not on need, but on greed. We think that need is subjective. In Enbridge's application to the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, access to a, quote, stable supply of oil was the primary measure of need. It turns out that the world's largest oil reserves are in the Western Hemisphere, in Venezuela, followed by Saudi Arabia, and then the Alberta tar sands. Venezuela is a country that has demanded a fair price for oil and used that oil to develop its infrastructure. Instead of paying a fair price for oil, however, Oil interests are far more interested in securing oil from places that do not wish to give up their oil. people remain committed to protecting our land and water. This is what we are instructed to do by our ancestors, and that is our covenant with our ancestors and our Mother Earth. That is also our covenant with the generations yet to come. This is not just a native issue, an indigenous issue. It affects us all. Whether you have feet, wings, fins, or roots, 
We are all in this together. No corporation has a right to this land, water, and our future. This is Winona Duke for Honor the Earth. <laughs> well, um, that uh, that ride took place this fall, and they, I believe they're looking to uh, take another ride. That. The ride came from a dream that Winona had, and it was about, um, it was, it was uh, her way to negotiate the challenge. And instead of, instead of riding with the flow, it would happen, that, that was proposed, she decided to ride against the flow. And there were many, many community uh, welcome, communities that welcomed them. Um, there were several riders. And, and two different, I think, uh, two separate times that they would take a whole tract and go, you know, along the pipeline and then up north and then went out with the Lakotas. And um, that proved to be really unifying and really empowering um, because as the people were writing, they were praying, they were thinking, they were, I think, uh, coming to terms with with uh, what their next steps would be, how they may participate in the resistance, how they may participate in protecting. And um, so that's where the we're protectors, not protesters, came from. And um, so with, uh, with that thought, um, this is uh, an opportunity because of the economics that we're looking at, which is her forte, and I really apologize. I'll, I'll just say that right up front, that um, this, is, this is what she would be presenting in 10 times better than I am. And I'll do my best to, to, to present it. So thank you. Um, so it's a matter of how you might look at uh, the uh, economics of the way that we used to live, the riches we used to have. All of, uh, all of our resources, we're talking our medicines and our foods and our lands and everything was in balance. And um, re returning and restoring that kind of economics or local economies or expanded economies uh, will help things continue in balance. And um, the thing with the pipeline is, is that we're going all the way from up north clear down to the south and then way across the big water, you know, to China. And so that's, that's what the problem is. And we want to refocus and we want to get back to our cyclical um, economies and cyclical uh, uh, restorative economics. Indigenous economics is what it is. And return to sustainability. Um, and that is cyclical. And that's not necessarily linear, which is what a lot of people practice nowadays. Um, so with this, this is um, uh, who we are, which is the Anishinaabe people. And this is from Winona. I'm actually uh, Luceno from Southern California. And so this is her speaking. Um, and so what she's talking about is that uh, this is the cyclical uh, calendar and the and that's based on you know what the seasons are when you harvest and and um, uh, how you pay attention to what's going on in the environment and if it's skewed because of it's out of balance then you're not going to be able to do things appropriately ceremonial or on time um, let's see so what this is the uh, detail of the of the cyclical calendar and so it talks about um, even though the months are in there, it's really more about the seasons. And so we look at the first uh, harvest of the month, uh, oh, the 
first harvest of the season is the maple syrup. The first ceremony of the season is the maple syrup. Um, and that the next ceremonies are seed and that we continue our garden. And then the next one is about the rice, harvesting the rice and harvesting the foods that we have and then putting those, uh, putting those away for the winter. And that's when we put the, um, uh, uh, put the soil, put the ground to rest. And that's a reflective time for us, that's storytelling, that's time for us to reflect and to um, regenerate re, uh, ourselves as well. Um, and so with that the being a learning time, we're hoping to return to that rich economy you know, through this indigenous economics. But we have a new uh, challenge, and that is, you know, threatening not only not only our environment and our ecosystem, but threatening ourselves and our livelihoods with the capitalism 2.0. Um, I'll just leave that one at that. So these are the proposals, and uh, they were talked about in the video as well. And um, so these are more described uh, more in depth, you know, in, in those handouts as well. Um, so Enbridge operates in Canada and U.S., and it's the longest crude oil and liquids pipeline. Uh, in Minnesota, nearly 1.5 million gallons of oil have spilled out. And, uh, and that's over the last 30 years. Enbridge is also a 50-year-old company. Um, and our challenge to that is that we've been here for many more years than that, and generations, and that we hope to be here for another. Um, so the crude oil uh, from North Dakota to Superior, Wisconsin is, is one of the plans. And then there's another plan, which is uh, Clear, Brook, Clear Brook through Rapid City. That's not right, I'm sorry. So all the way from North Dakota to Superior, Wisconsin. So they have two options. And one of their options is to go from Clear Brook through Park Rapids, and the other is, is to go through uh, Bemidji, from Clear Brook to Bemidji. One of the things that is going to be a benefit to us is that it's in our treaty territories. And when we look at what we can do is we can partner, we can support the treaty process, we can support the treaty language. And that's where everybody can come together to support that. That's a unifying uh, tool uh, through the intervention process for everybody to participate in. Um, and so these particular pipelines are going to cross the 1855 uh, treaty territories, and that includes the White Earth, Leech Lake, Fond du Lac reses, reservations, and will immediately affect the Red Lake, Boys Fort, and Net Lake, as well as Mill Axe. And that's also threatening the Mississippi headwaters. Um, so this is a list of the, the uh, documented spills. Um, en Enbridge has, has not proven itself to be a safe part of our environment. Um, it's not if, but when the spill will occur. Our wild rice beds will be destroyed, but Enbridge won't be here. We'll be here. We're here for generations. We're here past generations, future generations, but Enbridge is here for a short period of time to make some money. For the coal, we have, uh, and this is the here we know this word that you'll appreciate, dirty coal for dirty mines and uh, pipelines. So Minnesota and Great Lakes region, uh, those are destructive. In Minnesota, we have uh, Minnesota powers and they are, they are, you can tell, they're, they're quite aged. There's 80 years old, there's 60 years old, there's 82 year old, 
those, those, that equipment is extremely old, which makes it extremely dangerous on top of that. And they're providing energy, providing that for the largest consumers of this energy, who is the pulp and paper industries and the mining and the pipelines. So. All right. So to this, one of the things that Winona says is that just because it can be extracted doesn't mean it should be and that not all resources are up for extraction. And these are the proposed mining um, that I, I believe was talked about earlier this morning. One of the problems with uh, sulfide mining is that there were tests done for the wild rice, which is one of the medicines, one of the powerful uh, foods and medicines for people. And um, that if these, if our rice beds are, are uh, affected by any of these spills, the rice beds will go away. They won't, they won't stay. Um, and they're very sensitive to any of the uh, toxins that will be in there. So. That's one of the things that we're trying to uh, preserve, and that's why we're resisting is because, um, because of the, uh, the value that that wild rice has for us, um, and that being a medicine, along with the waters. The waters shouldn't be, shouldn't be polluted as well. Um, and so Otter Creek, um, the proposed Otter Creek coal mine, and that's by Arch Coal uh, Company, that would destroy the Otter Creek watershed and render that land unclaimable. And that's also been suggested by uh, the National Academy of Science that that could be considered a sacrifice area. And that land is a, uh, is a, is a sacred land to the Northern Cheyenne. And that's being overlooked, that's not being considered. And so that the challenge is with that is that what's valuable to, to one may not be valuable to the next, and what the harm may have, what the harm may be um, forthcoming, what may be coming. Um, so partnerships with tribal leaders, tribal members, organizations, and shareholders, they often unite communities. So I mean that particular, uh, you know that that particular event brought in a lot of support and a lot of people from around the area. And it just shows how unifying, you know, coming together for all the right reasons, which, which the central reason, it, reason is, is that we all want a clean future. We all want clean water. We want healthy lands, thriving soil for our future generations. Um, so what we have is, this is, it is really historical, and I, I know that um, there were representatives from Keweenaw Bay today uh, who, who I hope talked about this, but talk about wealth, talk about, about the richness that you have. That's a lot of maple star sugar. That's a lot of maple sugar. And the mines are threatening that. It's becoming um, difficult for that to for that to continue, if it's if it's polluted and if it's if it's uh, threatened, um, and so what we have is that we can look at our history, and that you know with those with that's from such a time ago, and then 1906 seems so seems so uh, current because uh, because of the model because of the the uh, uh, design of the greenhouse and, and how that is, you know, it was a sign of the past and then 1906 looks like it could today. And then further, this is some of the things that are happening up in uh, White Earth uh, with the high tunnels and some of the gardens. White Earth Land Recovery Project is working on this. 
to restore indigenous communities, uh, indigenous economies as well. Um, and again, we can look back at our history, and it tells us it tells us what's going to what we need to do for our future, what we need to do for our present, in order to make a future for our generations. And so up at White Earth, what's, what's happening, and um, this ju is just an example, but I bet it's uh, reflective of, of a lot of the communities that you're from as well. And that's 14% reservation households that food money has stayed local. And that means that a lot of it has left, which means that if we turn around and look at our local food systems, we can employ our people. We can we can use less fossil fuels by transporting and transporting foods and so forth. And this is the job promise. Those the jobs that are that are uh, uh, listed as job creation for these kinds of projects. From what I understand, is that these are very short term. I mean, it could be five years, which could do a lot of damage. It could be five years, but that's short term for somebody. That's short term for a community member to not be able to, to have a long term job. That's, that's pretty short term. There she is. <laughs> This is what she's working on, and and um, this is the economy that she's the, the, that she's uh, strengthening at White Earth. This is uh, some of the white corn that they've been growing, um, and they've been working on push not pushing it, but um, establishing some of the different uh, suitable corn strains for their particular region. This is an example of Will Allen. He's based out of Milwaukee. He is in an urban greenhouse district. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with his projects. Growing Power? He's doing amazing work, and it's about how, how you can do, you can grow in just very small space, or you do the best with what you can, you know, with the space that you have. And that um, he's looking at not only feeding his immediate community, it's just, it's, it's, first vegetables, and then it goes into meat, and then like poultry, and then fertilizer, and, and so he's really building a lot within the urban community there. This is part of the corn restoration project that they're doing, and um, these are some of the varieties that they're growing up at White Earth, and the uh, Seneca pink lady flower corn is Winona's favorite, just so that you know, because it's pink. Um, Jonesy Miller is actually uh, Menominee, and he works in Oneida for a program, uh, Junhequa, if you may have heard of that, a community-based 83-acre um, certified organic farm. Um, and so they're working on not only having that corn itself, having the seed and the responsibilities for carrying that seed, carrying it over for the next year or the next year. But they're doing seed selection, they're doing preservation with, and processing of the corn. And that takes a lot because the corn itself is generally really high moisture. So caring for it once it's off the field is just as challenging as caring for it while it's while it's on the field and before that with your seed. Uh, let's see. Okay, so a historic, I'm just having a little bit of a deficit time. <laughs> Try to have a deja vu with me. So this is a historical photo as well. And um, if you look at how it used to be and then today, it is still very much like that. And, you know, the, the rice itself has a, has a very strong economy. <sighs> Let me see here. <laughs> um, I just need the PowerPoint. This is a 
me for you. <laughs> Global warming. Thank you so much. Um, so that just shows the the what are they 20 20 year increments of the increase on global warming. Oh, thank you. So the, um, that again with the uh, White Earth Land Recovery Project um, and Honor the Earth, we'd, we're hoping to regain, regain food sovereignty and um, by growing heritage uh, seeds, heritage varieties, and not only with the corn, but with the, um, with sort of squash. Okay, so in order to get back to our roots, so this is, these are some of the opportunities that we have as communities uh, to be able to um, participate and engage on a local level. <laughs> and we, I, can, I can continue to read those for you if you like. Um, so intervening in the process is really important for us. Um, it, it seems like the further along it gets, um, the harder it gets, but it doesn't mean we can't stop. And it means that if we're on it from the very beginning, we can continue um, by being, being present and participating, saying no, signing, writing, those kinds of things. Um, and with, it, with the EPA, it's really important um, to be in contact with them and make some demands on them as well. She had to put that in there, I don't know. Okay, so this is really powerful. Um, it's about how long you're gonna allow somebody to, to keep doing something. When is it time to step up? And I'll let you read that yourself. So on the website, the honortheearth.org or honorearth.org, um, they're actually revamping the website to make it more user-friendly and make it so that you can take action. So there'll be kits on the website uh, so that you're able to, to write letters, so that you're able to um, you know, gather some people and, and uh, work in solidarity in your communities and in, in whatever way you might be able to do that, uh, to help um, resist and to help protect the lands, protect the earth and our Mother Earth who's, pro who's providing for all of us. And if we continue at this rate that we're at, we're throwing that into question because we have that covenant, we have that understanding and that respect that we need to continue our responsibilities as humans, and that means giving thanks, and that means acknowledgement to all life forces, and keeping our relationships well, keeping those strong. Is that the end? Oh, good. <laughs> Can we keep this secret? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll miigwetch Joe, and since you're the lone presenter yeah, this half, she gets all the questions <laughs> focused at her. Does anybody oh, have any uh, questions for Joe? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Uh, 
400 and some 100,000 pounds of sugar out of the Keweenaw Bay store is in addition to the Ontonagon figures that I've been using. That's 248,000 that I've been using on the Ontonagon buy in 1880. And in addition to, uh, if you can go back and ask Winona that, that sure. means we're talking about 600,000 pounds of sugar in 1880 coming out of this area. And you multiply it at an average of about $22, $23 a pound of sugar nowadays, the 248,000 pounds comes to $5.4 million. So when you double that, if it's a figure that's inclusive or you add to it, that's 600,000, that's $15 million worth of sugar at today's value coming out of the peninsula from two sugaring operations. <laughs> Ask Winona. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Richard. I wanted to respond to this man's point. Uh, I used to produce maple syrup commercially, and uh, we started out in Big Rapids, and uh, we were the only young, there were three of us, we were a partnership, we were the only young men individuals trying to do this and we would go to organizations in northern lower Michigan and all the old families would be there they were so excited to see us they wanted us there so through this five and year experience that I had I began to study it more and found out that Michigan has more sugar maples than any other state in the Union think of that it, yes. Yeah, we with the potential for production of maple syrup and jobs along that line, which is what I think your Winona is getting at, is absolutely phenomenal. So that's just one point to everybody. Over here. Not so much a question as please tell Winona to run for president in 2016. Please, 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 please. <laughs> I will. I'll pass that on. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, miigwech. And, um, you know, at this time, could we have all our presenters kind of come up here? We just like to, I mean, I don't know, say how very much we appreciate you folks coming out. I know it wasn't an easy travel. Um, and as we like to do in a, in, a good, in a good native way, we like to also present you with some gifts to say, we quit. Thank you for being a part of the summit and making it what it is. So to that end. Uh, April, yeah. Or Tina, would you be able to come over and help me grab some of this. Thank you. Or whoever is going to have the pen, April. <laughs> uh, over there. Let's see here. We got Mike and. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Jessica Miigwitch. Paul Miigwitch. And Jill Miigwitch. Miigwech, team Miigwech. We so appreciated it.
All right, at this time, our, our presenters aren't quite done. What I think we'd like to do is kind of break into several groups. I think we have enough to have roughly 10, 12 people per group um, to go with each of one of our presenters and brainstorm exactly how do we start thinking regionally? How do we start thinking of ourselves as protectors of the earth, as, as we discussed in, in Jill's presentation? What are some steps we can take to protect the land that we're talking about? How do we face these regional threats like the mines? And then um, Jill's presentation brought in the pipelines. And we got boards, we got those easels, and we got markers. We'd like each group to brainstorm with one presenter and all come back together well, let's try for at least three, maybe five ideas, see what we can come up with as to plans that you guys think, hey, as a region, this is what we can do. This is how we can get together. And at the same time, be thinking, how can we take what we talk about here today? How can we take that to the next level? How do we stay in touch? How do we stay in contact? How do we not just dissipate when this is all over? So I'm going to ask people to kind of, uh, let's just, Try to keep it about 10 to 12 people per group. We have four presenters. And let's just for the moment, just for, for the sake of getting together, you got an idea? Yeah, yeah go for it. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. No, I'm good. <laughs> okay. No, hey, this is this is grassroots democracy. <laughs> yeah. Large group, you like that? Sounds good to me. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, okay. Let's break out the easels and the thinking caps and the caring hearts and everything we already got gathered in this room. And um, 